Welcome to the panel discussion on the Afghan peace process, the way forward. My name is Shra Ibrahim. I'm the senior advisor to the State Ministry for Peace. The panel discussion today is being co-hosted by the State Ministry for Peace, along with the American University of Afghanistan, as well as the American Institute of Afghanistan Studies. This will be the first of many panel discussions and talks in a series of events. The State Ministry of Peace believes that we should create more platforms to be able to reflect voices and the diverse range of opinions within the country to the global stage with the hope uh, and the intention that we slowly try to shift the center of gravity of the peace process to where the peace is actually supposed to happen. With that in mind, I'd like to introduce the moderator for today's panel discussion, uh, Mr. David Sidney, who, as you all know, is the president of the American University of Afghanistan. Um, Mr. Sidney previously served as the chair of the Board of Trustees of AUAF and its acting president. He was Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Central Asia, Deputy Assistant, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for East Asia, served as Deputy Chief of Mission, U.S. Embassies of Beijing, Kabul, Baku. Mr. Sidney is a graduate of Princeton University and Suffolk University School of Law, a distinguished graduate of the National War College, and has received the Secretary of Defense Medal for Distinguished Public Service. I'll hand it over to David now, please. Thank you, Shwab. Thank you very much. And I want, on behalf of the university, I would like to welcome everybody to the American University of Afghanistan. Uh, for, for the session on the way forward on peace. I want to uh, thank uh, the, the Ministry of Peace and the American Institute of Afghan Studies uh, for co-hosting and playing the major roles in organizing, uh, in organizing this event today. I'll note that uh, earlier in the week, we also, along with the U.S. Institute of Peace, hosted a two-day peace summit uh, with, uh, with, with, uh, people, with young people from all over Afghanistan. Uh, talking about ways forward with peace, coming up with ideas. So this is a major focus of the university and, of course, a major focus, maybe the major focus, uh, for the country of Afghanistan. Uh, the topic of peace is really paramount, and I look forward, along with all of you, to hearing the views of our panelists today. Uh, from starting on the left, we have Professor, Professor William Malley from uh, Australia. Professor Malley is a very distinguished scholar. He's written uh, uh, books, articles uh, on a range of subjects. Most recently, uh, he's published a piece on Australia-Afghanistan relations, uh, which was presented uh, earlier this week at the Australian Embassy here and two weeks ago at the Australian, um, uh, at the, uh, in, in uh, the Australian capital of Canberra. Uh, he's actually here, uh, we're fortunate to have him here as an election observer today, something I think you've done, what, five times before, Bill? Something like that, <laughs> hard to count. But we're very, very honored to have uh, Professor William Malley here. Uh, here we, we have um, Minister, our Governor, uh, because she has been both, Habibis Harabi. Uh, she's been Minister of Women Affairs, Governor of the Province of Bamiyan, uh, someone who is an eloquent voice uh, for the rights of women, for the interest of women in peace, but also for all of Afghans uh, uh, from, from everywhere in Afghanistan and their interest in peace. Um, I'd like to also um, introduce uh, Professor Omar Sadr. We're very fortunate that he is a professor here at the American University of Afghanistan. Uh, he received his PhD from the South Asia University in uh, New Delhi, uh, and he has written extensively on the peace process, diversity, and multiculturalism, and critical thought uh, as well as the history of Afghanistan. So he is a very, has a very wide-ranging set of academic interests, and we'll look forward to his thoughts today on peace. And then uh, finally, but, and he'll, actually, he'll be speaking, uh, speaking last, is Sami Mahdi, uh, a journalist who's now with, uh, he's now the Afghanistan Bureau Chief, uh, Chief for Radio Free Europe, uh, Liber Radio Liberty. Before that, he was with Tolo TV, hosted a number of programs on uh, Tolo TV. Um, and uh, we have a connection because of the people sitting here. Where I think we're the only ones who've lived in Boston. 
uh, and, uh, and uh, Sami, uh, the Fulbright student at the University of Massachusetts in Boston, and so a fellow Bostonian. So maybe we can say, go Red Sox or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> That's an inside joke for people who, uh, who follow American baseball, which I'm sure there aren't too many, uh, many here. Um, but uh, with that, uh, let me just, the, the format is going to be each of our panelists will speak for about seven to ten minutes, and then we'll move on to questions and uh, look, forward, look forward very much to some very active questions. I want to uh, thank uh, all of you for coming, for the members of the faculty. We have several students here as well. Uh, so I want to thank everyone for being here. And Professor Malley, if I can ask you to start, please. David, thank you very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here at the American University and have the opportunity to share some thoughts about uh, the whole peace process issue. Uh, I mentioned two things at the outset. One is that I've been writing about uh, the issue of talking to the Taliban for more than 12 years now. I first published a paper about this in the World Today in London in 2007. But the perspective that I want to adopt in my remarks today is not so much from that of somebody who's worked on Afghanistan for a long period of time, but rather drawn from my day job as a professor of diplomacy. And I'm interested in these remarks in saying a little bit about flaws in the process which has uh, so recently unraveled and some of the dangers of peace processes. And I hope that in doing so I'll clear away a certain amount of debris uh, that will then uh, uh, open up space for discussion in the question period as well. And I'd say at the outset that from the point of view of a professional negotiation analyst, this was one of the most amateurish and poorly designed processes that I have ever witnessed anywhere in the world. And there were six particular flaws in the process that I want to mention right now. The first was that it commenced in the context of routine messages coming out to the effect that there was no military solution to the problem in Afghanistan, combined with a whole range of rhetorical devices suggesting not just a desire but almost a desperation for agreement on the part of um, the negotiating team from the United States. And one of the very basic rules of negotiating is not to make it look at the outset as if you are very, very keen to get an agreement because that invites the other side to demand as much as possible and concede as little as possible in the course of a negotiation process. They're going to try to do that kind of thing anyway. But if you look uh, from the outset as if you have limited your own options, then that similarly limits your scope for manoeuvrability within a diplomatic process and advantages the people with whom you are engaging. Now, that may not be so much uh, of a problem if you're talking what, about what could be a win-win negotiation, but it's pretty clear that for large numbers of people in Afghanistan there was a grave fear that this would end up being a win-lose negotiation, creating significant bodies of losers as well as winners. A second serious problem was the exclusion of the Afghan government. Uh, but with one very peculiar feature which has not received very much attention at all. One press report that came out after the 7th of September, but which then sort of disappeared into the fog, uh, noted that there had a rather late in the stage been a proposal for the release uh, of 5,000 prisoners from Afghan jails uh, coming from the Taliban. Now, uh, this is quintessentially the kind of thing that the American team should have met with the response, we cannot do that, you need to talk to the Afghan government about that because although there were many things under discussion which the United States could unilaterally deli deliver, such as a withdrawal of forces, it was not in a position unilaterally to deliver uh, the release of prisoners in the custody of the Afghan government. And that had the effect, which I suspect wasn't fully understood by the negotiating team, of turning the Afghan government into a veto player from the purposes of the ongoing uh, trajectory of negotiations. It didn't reach that point because of President Trump's tweet, but that had the potential to give a very different twist to what the next stage of the negotiations would have resembled and suggested a real design flaw from, from my point of view. Um, uh, an another problem with the process was that um, the, the uh, United States proved in effect to be the gift that keeps on giving, really, that uh, the Taliban received the precious gift of a seat at the table with the United States in exchange for virtually no meaningful uh, concessions uh, at that stage. And that's not a good idea. 
And coming back to the point I was making earlier about uh, the atmospherics, that seat at the table remained available to them even after the 9th of May when the attack occurred in Kabul on the counterpart international office, which saw civilians being attacked uh, in a flagrant violation of international humanitarian law uh, when they were working in projects that were actually partly funded by the United States Agency for International Development. And if ever there was a moment in a negotiation process where uh, a negotiator should have said, this is a bridge too far, come back when your behaviour is acceptable, that was the time to do it. And some, the older ones among us, may remember that in the late 1990s, uh, a prominent member of the Taliban uh, hit a UN staffer over the head in Kandahar with an empty teapot. And that was sufficient to prompt Ambassador Brahimi at the time to uh, require the withdrawal of UN staff from Kandahar. And he made a very clear explanation. He said, if you want to be accepted at the table internationally, there are rules that you have to follow. And if you're not prepared to follow them, don't expect to be an acceptable actor. And it's very dangerous to send a signal to actors in the negotiation that no matter what they do, they're going to retain a place at the table. You tie your hands behind your back when you do that. Uh, another significant problem in a negotiation is if affected groups are kept well away from the negotiating table. And the obvious example of this uh, was women in Afghanistan who, whatever the travails of the last 20 years, have uh, had very significant changes in opportunities available to them and every reason to fear that uh, political arrangements might see their gains being sacrificed as part of a bargaining process. And when that's the case, if groups such as that are excluded from the negotiating process in order to keep the team small or in order to prevent people from raising difficult issues, it's simply setting the scene for significant problems at a later stage of implementation. There was, in addition, the problem, I think, of a controversial US negotiator, uh, widely welcomed by a lot of international actors, but regarded with scepticism by a range of circles in Afghanistan. I remember a former US ambassador to Afghanistan saying to me once that he felt the United States should never send as an ambassador or an envoy to a country somebody who had in the past been a citizen of that country simply because that issue of identity, beyond the control of the individual concern, would blur signalling, leaving doubt about whether the individual involved in the negotiation was pursuing a United States agenda or a personal agenda of his or her own. And it's a sage warning uh, about the way in which personality can intrude into diplomatic negotiation. And of course, uh, some remember uh, Dr. Halilzad's article in the Washington Post in 1996 after the Taliban took Kabul call, called Afghanistan Time to Re-Engage, which had some pretty naive views about what was likely to happen here. And then one very dramatic change which occurred during the course of the negotiation was a shift away from the initial uh, mantra that nothing is agreed until everything is agreed in favour of a different notion, a two-stage process in which there would initially be agreements on uh, the withdrawal of US forces and the prevention of the use of Afghan territory by international terrorists, with what had initially been part of the nothing is agreed until all agreed formula being remitted to a later stage. Now, um, Francis Bacon in his essay on negotiating said it is better to deal with people in appetite than people who are where they want to be. And that's the reason for saying nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. If people have a kind of prospect in a negotiation of getting something they would like, you then use that as a way of leveraging concessions from the same actor at a later stage. If you sever the process in the middle, you actually give them what they want without retaining the leverage to recover what you would like. And that leads me to just a couple of points I want to make about dangers of peace processes uh, broadly. Peace processes are not neutral. They affect the environment within which the process is itself being structured and carried out. A peace process can incentivise violent behaviour. If the cessation of violence is not a precondition for participation in the process, it can actually provide a participant with an incentive to use violence to try to claim as much territorial control as possible so that when negotiations reach a, reach a critical point, the power that has been using violence is in what it sees as a strong a possible position to get what it wants at crunch time. Uh, 
peace processes can also have morale effects on the wider environment. And there was a very interesting article in the New York Times uh, quite recently quoting a soldier from the Afghan National Army talking about the conundrum of a situation in which he was being asked to die for the state whilst people uh, associated with the political community more broadly were engaged in negotiations with the Taliban. It's a peculiar position which to find oneself. Uh, and in the worst situation, a peace agreement can actually trigger a cascade in which people who may not like a group like the Taliban may nonetheless align with them because prudentially it's not a good idea to be on what seems to be a losing side. And Thomas Hobbes once said, reputation of power is power. And uh, if one of the worst things about the recent negotiation was that it undermined the reputation of the Afghan government in a gratuitous fashion, with the risk that this could trigger a cascade of people repositioning themselves and suddenly leaving a process falling to pieces in front of one. Um, and of course, this is particularly a danger when you have a peace process, which might be really a device by which uh, a great power can cut and run from a situation which it sees as domestically uncomfortable, or cut without appearing to run, um, such as the South Vietnamese negotiations of 1993. The final point I'd make is it is very rarely the case that a complex problem can be solved at high speed with a rabbit out of the hat solution. Uh, successful peace processes like the South African peace process um, have taken years of trust building amongst actors who have come to distrust yourself, them, each other for rational reasons. And I see no reason to think that a rabbit out of the hat situation in Afghanistan has any better prospects than in other situations where it's failed the world catastrophically. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Maley. Well, I think it's often said you can't know where you're going unless you know where, you, where you've been and how you got to where you are. And I think Bill has done that part of it and set us up as we look forward to, to the way ahead on the peace process. So with that, uh, Minister Sarabi, let me put this over a little bit for you. Okay. Please. Uh, thank you very much, Sydney, and very good, good morning to all of you. Uh, There is no doubt that uh, every Afghan citizen uh, wants peace. Uh, so, but uh, what's the price of peace for us as an Afghan? This is very important that we have to uh, think about the price of peace. So uh, we always have been talked about that, that what's the price of peace for us? Uh, we have uh, close contact with the community, with the people. When I I'm talking about we, we as a High Peace Council and also the people who are, we are uh, um, somehow engaged with the peace process. So there are three things that the people of Afghanistan are, are emphasizing on that. One is the uh, inclusivity uh, of the peace process. Uh, this one, whenever we have been talked, when have, we faced with the people of Afghanistan, they are talking about the inclusion. This is something that always, especially uh, me as a representative of women with the uh, HPC or High Peace Council, always uh, women are talking that women should be included to the peace process. This is one thing. And without uh, uh, women inclusion, the peace process is nothing for, for us as a women. Uh, we, last year, we initiated uh, some, uh, um, some program with the uh, it was a joint initiative uh, with the High Peace Council, the First Lady Office, and also with the uh, Ministry of Women's Affairs and the uh, AWN, Afghan Women Network. We traveled for every single province and had the gathering on the name of the Women's Symposium. And the, uh, the desire or the, uh, the, uh, the lessons that we learned from women, uh, these were the the things that I'm talking about that. Unfortunately, uh, some said that it is a kind of governmental initiative. So the government in every country and everywhere, they are paving the road that the others should ride on that. 
But if uh, the government cannot pave the road, who can pave that one? So that's why the government, as a government and semi-government, of course, civil society was also a part of that initiative that we made this, uh, uh, this facility to go to every single province and, and listen to the women to get their advice. So they were talking about the uh, inclusion. The other thing that uh, mostly the people were talking about transparent, uh, transparency of the, uh, the, the peace process. Uh, for, uh, for the transparency, they are mostly talking uh, recently, this um, Saturday actually, uh, with this uh, civil, uh, civilian representative of NATO. We were in Herat. Uh, we had a meeting with the uh, women representative and youth representative. So uh, they were talking about the uh, transparency of the peace uh, process and said that the outcome of peace is much more important than the, uh, the signing the paper. This is very important. So um, the outcome should be something that the people of both sides should uh, receive to some sort of tranquility. It's not only to sign the paper, but the outcome is very uh, very important, and also they were talking about the, we shouldn't uh, um, uh, sacrifice the quality for the speedity. We, should, we shouldn't do a lot of, uh, to accelerate the speed or to rush for that, that if we can uh, speed up, of course, we will face some, some sort of accident. So that's why uh, the, uh, we, we shouldn't for, uh, sacrifice the quality for the expeditions. So this is something that we uh, get from the, uh, from the uh, youth representative of, and also the women representative. So one of the young ladies told me, I am ready to sacrifice that my next generation will uh, live in a proper peace and justice, uh, and, and they will uh, 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 live in a, a safer environment. This is something that we got from the people, and it's the, the people desired. Uh, the last one, it is, which is uh, very important, that uh, unfortunately the, in, in, in that peace process was a kind of bottom-up. Only the elite of the, the uh, country was involved with the peace process, and also it was a kind of negotiation. Uh, it was negotiation between the U.S. and the Taliban. But the bottom-up approach was completely forgotten. So this is very, very important that the people should be engaged with the peace process and they should see themselves uh, uh, on, the, on the peace process that they can feel as uh, ownership for the peace process. This is also important. Um, I was with the last uh, negotiation uh, with the Hezbe Islami. We had uh, 24 terms of, of negotiation at the end because it, the, uh, it was uh, the woman, especially the victim uh, representative, uh, representative was not included. And you could see the result of that, that it was the Amida Barmaki uh, picture was hung, uh, hung in the in front door of the uh, Hezb Islami. It was a clash between the people on that time. It was the, re the reason or the, it was the result of the uh, uh, exclusion of the uh, victim uh, for that peace process. And you, for example, yesterday and the before yesterday, when the Hekmatyar had the campaign for election, he was threatening the people. So what does it mean? He is coming for election and running mm -hmm. for election. And again, he is threatening the people. If he will not be the winner, he will go back and take the gun and uh, start uh, shooting the, the people. So this is, this is something that we have to, to do something from the bottom. People should be engaged with the peace process. And recon of, of course, after the peace process, we have to think about the reconciliation, how to, to uh, uh, engage people on the community level. So these were the, uh, some lessons that I, I have learned from the peace process. So that's why uh, uh, this is, uh, and also for the, for the next step that the way forward, we have to think about this, the quality of the peace, the outcome of peace rather than the speed of, uh, of peace. And uh, so and also for the peace process, we have to have to be patient. So it, it will take time, it will require time, it will uh, require more engagement, so we shouldn't make some, some sort of uh, um, a deadline for the peace process. We can make it up to September or October or December. This is not something that we can reach to that. This is something that we have to uh, think about. 
So when, uh, the last issue that I want to mention, some says that uh, we as a women that we are making night uh, in the, uh, in, in, uh, inside Kabul, we are not representative of people. Who will be representative of people? If I'll not be representative of people or the other women and the people who are uh, working with the civil society, if they are not be the representative of people, who will be the representative of people? So of course we have a, a very strong engagement with the uh, people who are living in the rural area or with the uh, countryside in the provincial level. And step by step, of course, I cannot go directly to the very remote er uh, area, but if it requires I'll go there, but of course all the time I cannot go, but we have the representative from the provincial level and they have a connection or link with the people who are uh, on, the, uh, on the village level. This is a kind of network that we have done within the, among the uh, women, so that's why we, ha we want to get their voice, and the voice of people is very important for the, the peace process. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister Sarabi. I uh, already see some themes emerging here of the need for patience, for time, and for inclusion. Uh, uh, now let me turn to Dr. Mursadar for his presentation on uh, the way ahead on the peace process, uh, way ahead on peace. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, David. Uh, I think much of the ground was covered by Professor Milley. Uh, I'll try to present some propositions about how do we understand the current context and uh, the, the, the peace process that we had. Number one, I think it is characterized as a political settlement. It was mainly a kind of negotiation for redistribution of power, inclusion of the insurgents into a political process. And that also focused on two dimensions, which was mainly highlighted in, uh, in, the, in the media and uh, common uh, knowledge. The first one was uh, the possibility of an interim government, and the second one was, of course, postponement of uh, the elections and a power-sharing model. Um, the second one is that I think we all understand that uh, Taliban was an winner uh, somehow as a result of this negotiation, because as Professor Milley was mentioning, they had made no concessions, first of all, but they have ensured the withdrawal of uh, the U.S. forces. And thirdly, they have also ensured the sidelining of the government of Afghanistan, which was a limited, legitimate representative of the people. S thirdly, um, government of Afghanistan also lacked an institutional capacity and um, uh, expertise on delivering something with, on the peace process. It was also it lacked political uh, consensus within. Uh, and also an institutional uh, support for it. For example, we had National uh, Peace Council, but that was almost, we understand that that was difunctional. Later on, Ministry of High Peace Council was created and the idea was floating, but now nothing is coming up. Um, fourth one is the, um, a lot of the failure of this process was also um, credited to the character of Ambassador Khalizad. That goes back to his own personal uh, um, history, uh, how he was treating Taliban in back in the 90s, but also the way that he conducted negotiations in terms of the procedure, the way the sequences was happening. I think one of the problems was that how do you prioritize whether withdrawal should be the first item of negotiations or the ceasefire. Uh, now we understand that it should have been the ceasefire, the first um, uh, in terms of the sequencing to the, to, to the beginning of the negotiation. Uh, Khalizad also somehow uh, misunderstood Taliban in the sense that he tried to, as uh, Hussein Aqani uh, characterized it, he said that he treated Taliban as a noble savages instead of treating them as radical extremists, which provided a kind of national context for the other extremist groups uh, in the country. So that's why somehow the way that we perceive Taliban um, that how much they can be trusted and how much they can deliver also, that was also something that we, should ne we need to rethink about it. Um, fifth thing is about lack of any platform for regional consensus. Of course, uh, Ambassador Khalizad tried to move around uh, between China, Russia, and NATO, and the U.S., tried to create a consensus between these great powers, but however, we realize that even the European Union had a m much more uh, value-based human rights approach to peace vis-a-vis uh, -vis a political settlement. 
but um, he was not able to establish a platform for regional consensus in the region. The UN was also not, not in the capacity to create such kind of platform. The Central Asian countries, Iranians, uh, the Indians, Pakistanis. So you see the Indians and Iranians are completely excluded in the process. Central Asian states, independent initiatives, uh, uh, each of the countries, and Pakistan is much more in the focus. Um, so there's no uh, unified um, uh, consensus in the region also. Um, and last point, uh, I think lots of literature was produced with respect to peace process, but we didn't come up with a very noble analysis. For example, lots of analysis on the rule of women, uh, uh, lack of consensus, uh, how to trust Taliban, the character of Taliban. I think one of the areas that we can focus and uh, maybe rethink about uh, the whole process is to contextualize it within the global trend of uh, populism. I think the momentum which was created um, uh, in the peace process of Afghanistan, it was controlled by the two, at least two populist presidents uh, and prime minister. President Trump in the United States, which was running a populist agenda, as well as in the region, it was uh, Imran Khan with a populist agenda. In Afghanistan, somehow also you have the same. Uh, so then the question is how populism shaped our peace process. We understand that populism, it varies uh, context to context, but there are some commonalities across uh, countries, even either in the West or the East. The first one is that politicians try to uh, build up on this dichotomy of um, corrupt political elite and establishment and what's popular perspective of the people. Secondly, also they try to uh, create a, a kind of us versus them, and in this us versus them, they try to characterize people as a homogenous category. That what we had in Afghanistan is the government tried to build up on this narrative of republic, that they are defending this value-based democracy, but um, uh, I, I do not uh, so much, what, we, what I do not realize is that how much the people of Afghanistan has internalized the concept of republic and how much there is a unified perspective when it comes to this kind of political system. We are somehow taking this for, somehow for granted that, okay, we want a, a republic in this side and Taliban is the evil. Uh, of course, I do not want to suggest the other way around, but, um, but this was not something a substantial policy stance. The government failed to build up on such kind of rhetoric that they had in their advantage when it comes to the practices. Um, um, I think also um, th so many policies that government, for example, uh, pr presented, the, the peace jerga release of the Taliban, they were not much based on a substantial policy decisions. Rather, these were also a, some sort of populistic rhetorics that uh, they took. Um, the last characteristic of this, how we see populism is that um, some of the constituencies, traditional anti-Taliban constituency, for example, how they have lost their plot uh, to, the, to the other uh, constituencies. Uh, ideally, what we expected, that traditional anti-Taliban uh, constituency will not sit with the Taliban, will not compromise the, some of the values or even in the political uh, negotiations. But what it came was that most of this constituency shifted their perspective and then they went it and they have even given concession and, and what they have given us back to the people was a very nice, beautiful picture of the Taliban, that they have changed the Taliban, they are ready to uh, adopt some of the new norms and democracy, that later on we realized that was a failed perspective. Um, so that's what, what I propose is that I think if we come up with a, some sort of analytical perspective that how global trend of populism, both in the US and in Afghanistan and the region, uh, shaped our peace process and also the outcomes that we have now. That will give us uh, a new perspective. Thank you. Thank you very much. Again, some, I think some uh, very good ideas about things that need to be done moving forward with the peace process, and we'll have some chance to talk about that in the question and answer. And now, Mr. Sami Mahdi, uh, my fellow Bostonian. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Sidney, American University of Afghanistan and Ministry of Peace. Uh, I'm going to talk about the public perception about this peace process and the role of media. Um, first of all, I should say that Taliban were leading the flow of information about the peace process. 
Afghan government didn't have access much to it. The American side didn't want to share. And the Taliban were uh, leaving the information coming out to, to the public. So the public perception and the uh, media was following the lead of the Taliban. For example, uh, Mr. Suhail Shaheen, Taliban spokesperson in Doha, in the middle of night, the night like Mr. Trump, he would tweet something, and uh, in the early morning, all media outlets in Afghanistan would follow the lead. That was the first thing. The second thing I, I want to mention is media was busy with unanswered questions. There was no one to answer the questions media wanted to ask. The uh, Mr. Khali, Ambassador Khalizad's team never wanted to answer the questions. We had to wait until Mr. Khalizad would visit Kabul and if he would give an interview out. And the same things would repeat the four um, elements of uh, until everything is agreed, but never, never, uh, nothing is agreed. But I think that changed at the end of the peace process. I think they agreed on the first two elements, the withdrawal and the assurances of um, um, cutting the links between the Taliban and terrorist groups, but two other elements which are um, the uh, inter-Afghan dialogue and the uh, ceasefire, I think those were forgotten. The third thing is the trust deficit. The public and the media didn't trust the peace process uh, because we had a lot of questions which remained uh, un uh, answered, and it uh, created uh, an area of uh, uncertainty about the peace process. Actually, after the, um, uh, Mr. Trump's uh, tweet about killing the peace process, uh, media did some pullings. We had a poll, and uh, I mean, Radio Azadi in Afghanistan, also Tolo News had a poll. The Tolo News poll shows that over 75% of the voters were happy about killing the peace process by Mr. Trump. We uh, published a question and asked people to, uh, to answer it on our social media platforms like uh, Facebook and Twitter. We asked if you want we asked the people if you want um, uh, a restart of the peace process between the, uh, the United States and the Taliban, and 73% said no. And there was an interesting and uh, very, um, I mean, a very interesting uh, difference between Twitter and Facebook. The Facebook users, most of them said no. But the so-called elite, Afghan elite using Twitter and using English language for their communication, 55% uh, said yes. So there is a difference between the general public, the crowd out there, and the people who think they are, uh, they are the elite group and they, they speak English. Um, I think um, the... the, the there was another interesting incident that media covered it. After the uh, Taliban attack on the Green Village, it was very interesting to see none of the Western diplomats in Afghanistan condemned the attack naming the Taliban. They said, we condemn the last night's terror attack. And some people started asking questions, who is this last night? The new terror group who, you know, attacked the Green Village. So none of the uh, European countries, and including the United States, condemned the Taliban after the Green Village attack directly. None of them named the Taliban. Then some of the, uh, you know, social media users um, and the um, uh, journalists, they started questioning the, uh, this attitude. Maybe this is a new era we are uh, starting to enter. Um, the British ambassador and then uh, former British ambassador to Afghanistan, 
Mr. Um, what's his name? Nicholas K. Yeah, Nicholas K. Mr. Nicholas K. He was the first to come out and say, I don't mind condemning the Taliban by their name. Um, but just a few days after that attack, when this uh, Shashdarak attack happened and an American was killed and another European uh, from Rizal support were killed, uh, we, see, we saw the change in the attitude of uh, 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 foreign diplomats in Afghanistan who this time uh, condemned the Taliban uh, calling by name. So uh, I think the inclusion of people and public opinion makers here in Afghanistan, including media, was um, uh, the exclusion of uh, public opinion makers, including media, was a big problem with the peace process in Afghanistan. And that's why people didn't trust the, this peace process. And uh, uh, they wanted so much uh, transparency in the peace process. Although, as Minister Sorabi said, I think every single citizen of this country wants peace. The, the war started before I was born. So I, ha I have never seen a single day of peace in my life. But at the same time, the price of the peace is in the question. We have to question what kind of price we are going to pay and who is leading the peace process. If the public is, the general public is excluded from the peace process and their legitimate representatives are excluded from the peace process, I don't think the, um, uh, this kind of... Uh, uh, peace process will result in a real peace. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Sami Mehdi, and I think there are a number of, or a number of commonalities in what was presented, but also a number of differences. Um, I'd like to explore first uh, in a, taking advantage of the moderator's privilege here and ask uh, two questions. And the first question I would ask and ask each of the panel members to, uh, to, uh, to, to comment for a minute or two. Uh, the idea of uh, greater inclusion uh, of the, having the Afghan people, uh, Afghan women, uh, people from around the country uh, being included in the process uh, has been a theme, I think, across the panelists. But how do you do that? And so how about some... Uh, uh, some thoughts about some ideas on how to have that kind of inclusion as we look ahead towards a resumed peace process. And if you don't mind, I'll start uh, with you, Professor O'Malley, and just walk across, go across here for ideas on how to, the problem is inclusion, but what, what are some pathways to getting that kind of inclusion? Yeah. Well, firstly, if you're going to have an inclusive process, you need to give yourself plenty of time. Uh, a a, a high-speed process is the enemy of the inclusive process. It simply militates against the possibility of involving more than a small group of people at a elite level in the discussions rather than uh, a wide swathe of a population. Uh, I and a couple of colleagues published a paper with the Carnegie Endowment a couple of years ago on the possibility of trying to foster what we called a broad national dialogue, which was to try to provide, uh, in, uh, in parallel with the frameworks of the constitutional process, um, uh, a, a, a framework within which people who had become disgruntled with uh, politics and disgruntled with the conditions of life in Afghanistan could have an opportunity to air their concerns to others in a non-confrontational and rather quiet way. And I think that is something which does have some advantages as long as you don't try to rush the process and, 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 uh, and, and speed things up in, in a way that will be entirely unnatural. Um, it's also, I think, important to recognise that inclusiveness matters because people have themselves very different conceptions of what peace is and what peace uh, needs to entail. Uh, there's a, a very good book that came out just a couple of months ago by Professor Richard Kaplan of Oxford University called Measuring Peace, and his argument is that peace is actually a highly heterogeneous concept with uh, different understandings for different people. For, for some people, peace is meaningless without a very substantial component 
of justice, which may involve justice for the future, but it also may involve justice in respect of what has been perpetrated in the past in a war-torn society. And if that is central to people's understanding of peace, treating peace as simply uh, the elimination for the moment of conflict is not going to work. Uh, even Thomas Hobbes in his in his book, Leviathan, famously said, war consists not in a shower or two of rain, but a known disposition thereto, during which time that there is no guarantee to the contrary. Uh, and in that sense, peace is much more than just ceasing uh, uh, fire for a momentary uh, blip in time. If that were the case, you could say Hitler brought peace to Warsaw when he overran it in 1939. Uh, and that's not what most people understand peace to be. And the, the best encapsulation of this that I've ever come across was a comment that a Soviet dissident recorded about an anecdote that circulated in the Soviet Union in the 1950s. A man went to his rabbi and said, Rabbi, will there be a war? And the rabbi said, no, there will be no war. There will be such a struggle for peace that not a stone will be left standing. Uh, my proposal is very practical. Uh, so, first of all, we have to expand uh, the outreach program. We have to reach to the people who are on the provincial level, on the community level. So, uh, this uh, we already done some program, but if uh, the, there is a, a big need for that, we have to go for every uh, province and talk with the people and get their idea, not only for the women, but for the youth and the victim, uh, victim of war. So we proposed even on that time to uh, uh, Ambassador Khalilzad that uh, we are making, we uh, women group, we are making an advisory uh, board. This advisory board uh, so will make a, I mean, regular uh, meeting, and also when there is, uh, uh, there will be talk or negotiation. The, the person who is sitting on the at the table to negotiate with Taliban, this uh, women advisory board should advise them. So at the same time, we need a kind of technical committee for them that uh, this technical committee and advisory board should, uh, uh, um, I mean, uh, oftenly talk uh, to connect with the person who is sitting at the table and talking with Taliban. So this is one thing. Of course, uh, uh, the presence of the kind of side event or uh, uh, side presence for the civil society and women group is very necessary. If there is uh, um, the, some place the negotiation, the, the people or negotiation member can sit to, but there should be some place that the civil society and women's group should sit there and they have, uh, they should have access to the, uh, to, uh, the negotiation team. This is my practical um, proposal and we have propo proposed this one even with the, um, uh, during the negotiation with the uh, Taliban, US in, in Taliban negotiation. The same with the um, uh, victim of war. This is very important that we have to listen to the victim and get their voice and uh, uh, of course it's very necessary to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, their voice should be heard and also include to the decision or the agreement. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Dr. Komar Sadr. I think it depends on how do we characterize uh, uh, inclusivity. Uh, it's usually understood that three groups should be included in the, in the process, the, the, the victims, uh, the minority groups, and the women. Um, however, um, I think it's important to rethink about this um, in a much more broader sense. Inclusivity should also un we understood it, uh, in a sense of existence of a vibrant uh, uh, a public sphere, which provides a space for dissent. You could be, you could be uh, have this opportunity to come up and say something which is not uh, in agreement with the establishment or the insurgents. So, whether we have such kind of space of public sphere. That's questionable, but of course the, the group which should lead this kind of vibrant debate is public intellectuals. And that's why in Afghanistan, we don't have much public intellectuals coming up debating major themes with, with, with respect to peace process. Secondly, also in a fragmented society, um, inclusivity will be much more challenging. You don't have the three mentioned groups only, but also you have ethno-nationalist groups coming and claiming for some sort of space or representation in the process. 
So what happens is um, usually representation of ethno-national groups will be competitive, and that will also affect the outcome of the process, and most of these ethno-national groups will think that representation in the table of negotiation will also determine the, their space or share as a result of any settlement which will happen at the end. So that will again create a kind of divisive politics uh, as an outcome of negotiation. So for example, what you see, uh, the anti-Taliban constituency, uh, they somehow pushed their agenda to be in the table. And the aim was whatever outcome will come, for example, the share of the power, the share of the representation on the table will ensure the share for them at the, at the end. So that's why some of the people also think that as it, if, if we are only focusing on, on inclusivity in terms of ethno-national in Afghanistan, it's better to move on to substantial policy issues, uh, for example, of course, transitional justice should be ensured that as an issue to be on the table. Uh, the woman rights should be ensured as an outcome of negotiation rather than trying to include all ethno-national groups uh, in the process. Thank you, Doctor. Mr. Sami Bailey? Well, again, I will uh, talk from media perspective. I think uh, the personality of uh, peace negotiators um, and their characteristics should not uh, affect the public, pub, general public trust on the peace process. Um, if um, they are not credible enough or they are uh, understood to have uh, hidden or um, uh, agendas for the country or for themselves, then it's going to um, it's going to affect the public trust on the peace process. That's the uh, first thing. The second thing, I think, yes, um, the process should be inclusive. When we talk about inclusivity now, inclusiveness in Afghanistan, it's not just about the different ethnic groups, I guess. It's uh, different cultural groups and uh, uh, the generations. Uh, also women. Women should be represented, represented in, the, in the peace process in a more meaningful, uh, meaningful way, not just, I'm sorry, like a decoration of the, 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 the process. Uh, their concerns, their ideas, their uh, values should be included in the process. Otherwise, we are not going to have a peace process, but a return to the early days of 90s and uh, 2000. Uh, that's one thing. Um, the the um, government uh, team, the team which is going to represent the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan, should have uh, credible personalities there. Uh, not everyone can, uh, I think, uh, just because they are um, named by the government to represent the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan can represent the, the public and the republic. So that's why the first attempt of the government, like one year ago, when they, uh, um, I mean, uh, they said they are going to have um, 12 people who will represent the a number of people who represent the government, nobody took those people seriously, I'm sorry. The media didn't took those people seriously and nobody wanted to interview them from media perspective because nobody thought these people can bring peace to this country because they are not the real stakeholders of peace or war in this country. Thank you very much. I was going to throw out one more question myself before turning it over to the audience and I look forward to to, uh, to some uh, uh, probing questions from the audience. Uh, my question for anyone and everyone who wants to answer it here on the panel is uh, lo looking ahead, as the topic of the panel is, but also the, the process. Um, the, pro the process that we've had over the last year has been a U.S.-Taliban negotiations in a third country uh, in Qatar. Um, is the way ahead a resumption of that same format or, should, is, or is there a need for a possibility for another format? So just anyone who has any ideas on the format way ahead. Should it be a continuation of what's been happening or resumption of that? Or should we be looking for something in the future? Mr. Sami, maybe something different, I mean. <laughs> well, uh, I think the continuation of the current format 
uh, wouldn't lead to peace, real peace in Afghanistan, because it has already collapsed after one year and almost ten or nine rounds of talks. So there should be a change in the format. Uh, Afghanistan should be included in the peace process from the day one. Otherwise, um, I think uh, we are going to have another U.S. Um, uh, Taliban peace process, which result, which would, would result, I guess, to a withdrawal, not peace. I think three things should change uh, if we are supposed to resume the process. First of all, it should become more state-centric uh, in the sense that government should be part of it. That's not impossible because we had the experience of Ayubat uh, earlier Taliban was willing to sit with the government. Second thing, we need to also shift the sequencing of the three, four uh, thematic agendas of the negotiation. It should not be the withdrawal first and then also the other settlements and grant, grantees that Taliban present, but priority, priority should be given to the ceasefire first. Taliban should accept the cease, uh, uh, overarching ceasefire. Um, as also, about um, we should also think about some of the mechanisms to include the region because that was completely lacking in this whole uh, last one year. Uh, that should be an inclusive manner. Otherwise, there would be a risk of spoilers. For example, Indian out of the game, Iranians out of the game. Uh, any of them will con uh, potentially convert uh, into a spoiler. So, how to manage the spoilers? Also, it, it's it's very important. Well, thank you, Doctor. Minister? I think, first of all, the U.S. should take the initiative to make the regional consensus uh, and also support the government of Afghanistan to do the regional consensus. But the, uh, for the peace talk, the government of Afghanistan should be included to that. Without the uh, inclusion of a government of Afghanistan, the peace process is not for Afghan people. It's something that the, at the end um, there will be nothing. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Mali? Um, I think the process pursued up to this point is one to avoid at all costs in the future. Um, <laughs> during the Second World War, one of Churchill's political opponents died and he was asked what should be done with the body and he said, embalm, cremate, bury, take no chances. Uh, and I think that very much applies to this process. There should never be an attempt at a process which excludes the government of Afghanistan because the attempt to do so is implicitly a trashing of the entire process of seeking a constitutional order for the country uh, over the last 20 years. And it is grossly irresponsible actually to embark on a process which by undermining that entire notion of constitutional government has potentially dramatically adverse consequences for the people of Afghanistan. So that would be my first point. And um, really the second point I would make is that if there is to be an engagement in the future, it needs to be entirely realistic in understanding the regional environment. And I think that my, my colleagues' presentations here are uh, spot on. The, I, I've read pieces about the recent peace process which made not a single reference to Pakistan, as if the Taliban did not have sanctuaries outside the country which were crucial enablers of their, their action. I've read analyses which have suggested that it would be almost unfair to ask the Taliban to engage in a ceasefire because that's their main tool. That's implicitly an admission that they don't have uh, domestic popularity uh, in Afghanistan in which they could ground claims to political legitimacy. Uh, and frankly, I think it's very important that every uh, attempt to renew the process focuses on what at different stages been in fact a creeping invasion of Afghanistan from Pakistan. If nothing is done about that, we're setting the scene for a situation in which you might get signatures from a Taliban negotiation on a bit of paper and there will be not anything in place to prevent the Inter-Services Intelligence Directorate from funding and equipping a new force to realise its geopolitical objectives in Afghanistan. You call it Harakat al-Azadi or whatever. Uh, and uh, unless something is done forcefully to address that particular problem, uh, a great deal of talk about peace processes is just blowing the in, in the wind. Thank you. Appreciate very much the Bob Dylan reference there at the end. Uh, with that, let me open it up uh, to, the, uh, to the audience for questions. 
Uh, look forward to uh, questions from everywhere, and we'll start uh, here. Please uh, wait for a microphone. We have a, uh, someone coming with a microphone. And then when you – please just introduce your, your name and your affiliation and uh, keep your question pointed. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Giz Yari, and I am from uh, Civil Service Commission of Afghanistan. And thank you for a great discussion and also a very different perspective on the peace process. Uh, I do have a very quick and a direct question on more practical uh, aspect of the peace process. Um, we do have a huge problem with the unity of the elite group you are discussing right now without considering the local groups who need to be included in the peace process. Uh, I would be really appreciated to hear your proposal on how to unite the internal groups who will represent ultimately Afghanistan in the peace process. How would you uh, unite uh, groups from uh, political leaders to uh, community leaders to uh, civil society organizations to find a value and define a platform to go forward with the peace process in the future. Thank you. Thank you. That's an excellent question. As Sami Mehdi mentioned, the first group that was named uh, to represent Afghanistan was not seen as consequential enough. Uh, the second group was quite large. Uh, and uh, didn't, it, that didn't work out. There was a third group uh, that, again, many people thought partially represented Afghanistan. But So how do you get uh, representation that represents not just uh, the elite in Kabul, uh, but represents uh, all of the important parts of the Afghanistan body politic? Uh, Mr. Sami Mehdi, have you... I'm going to call on you first. Well, uh, with, with all due, due respect, I think the government has done a poor job in uh, bringing people together, uh, especially the uh, political elite in uh, Kabul. Um, I mean, we are not expecting the government to introduce a um, group of 300 people to go to Doha and negotiate with the Taliban. But at the same time, uh, the first group that uh, they introduced was very poor, and they were not the stakeholders, and nobody took them seriously. Um, I think uh, maybe we could not bring everyone in the same room for peace negotiations with the Taliban. I mean, um, a group of people who would uh, represent every single part of the society. But maybe... Um, there should be another ways of including people. Well, I will talk about how you cannot agree, because <laughs> it looks like after Saturday, the day after tomorrow, the, uh, the uh, presidential elections, we are going to be in a uh, way more weaker position to create uh, unity and bring everyone together uh, because the elections are expected to be fraudulent, uh, unfortunately, based on the um, 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 uh, what the observers of the elections say, and uh, we are going to have another political turmoil for uh, at least a couple of months or maybe more. So, I don't think just after the uh, the elections, presidential elections, we are going to be, have an inclusive and united group to represent Afghanistan. Please. Move on to another question. I realize the question's not been answered, but I'll ask uh, uh, as the, we go on. I'm oh, sorry, Minister Sarabi, please go ahead. If you, please go ahead. I can highlight a little bit on that. It's a very tough question, to be honest. Uh, I was uh, uh, responsible for the, making the list for the first time we wanted to go to, to Doha. I realized that how tough is that, that to, uh, to, to get everyone idea to the, to the list. It was very, very difficult. And we have been talked from, it was Friday. Friday is off, you know that in Afghanistan. We worked from uh, 9 o'clock up to uh, four in the afternoon, but we uh, we didn't come for some sort of decision to who will go, but at the end it was 250 uh, name on the list. Uh, but it is uh, it is very tough, but it's not uh, impossible. We can do it, but uh, it is uh, it needs a, uh, required a lot of work to do to be done, a lot of discussion and going a little bit. Some of the political figures should be should come down a, a little bit, and I think uh, women can play a big role 
goal if uh, uh, we decided on the, uh, um, the, the, the uh, chat group that we have uh, with the uh, AWN. Maybe sometimes women group can go and talk with these people. Also, um, the civil society is something that we can uh, encourage them to do, uh, uh, to talk with the political leader. Mostly the political leader is, or political figure is the toughest one because they want to, to be the champion of peace. I'm going to, uh, Professor Omar Sadr has a couple things uh, to say on this and then Professor Malley, but after that, rather than have all four panelists answer every question, I'm just going to designate one to answer the question so that we have more questions. Uh, Professor? Uh, the great danger that, to, that poses to the peace process is that we do not treat peace process as a national agenda, uh, which should be beyond any kind of partisan politics, but reducing uh, to that. So that's why it's, key, it's very important to do that. Third one is also um, to establish a kind of vibrant space for debate and also space for dissent. Um, I think we should also avoid a kind of peace process which is only um, a, a single exclusive, exclusionary um, one-dimensional process where a, a group of people are only negotiating. It should be much more multi-level. At the local level, communities should be engaged uh, uh, at the national level, of course, elites should be engaged and, and other dimensions. Uh, just very quickly on the specific question of unity. I think unity is actually not something you can realistically expect in this situation because people will legitimately have different perspectives on a whole range of critical issues related to the process. What's really important is to have mechanisms for the peaceful management of difference and for the uh, aggregation of different opinions into positions that can then be brought to play in diplomatic processes. This is where the legitimacy of the state is so important and the legitimacy of the government. Because if you have a legitimate government, then people, even if they disagree with its positions on specific issues, will nonetheless recognise that it deserves generalised normative support and it will be possible to implement the commitments that that government makes. One of the real difficulties at the moment the, why there's a craving for a more inclusive process is, is that there's a sense at the moment that the government is not in a position to play that integrating role and deliver a legitimate outcome even in the context of differing views that exist at, the, uh, at different levels within the society. Thanks very much. Uh, Professor Barry. Uh, Michael Barry, uh, the university professor here at American University of Afghanistan. I was very much struck in all the conversations how focus was brought to bear essentially on Afghans, to some extent on Pakistanis, and on a particular Afghan-American personality, but the elephant in the room is the United States itself. Given how the United States has shifted in its various positions since 2001, Given how we know that um, Afghan public opinion, regardless of what political side it takes, has been disoriented by shifts in American policy over the last two and a half years, I would like to ask the Afghan panelists in particular, Professor Mali also, what is your perception now of what American policy is, represents, and should be in the region. Can I conclude with a little image? You know how the symbol of the American Republican Party is an elephant. <laughs> we often refer in the English expression to the elephant in the room, meaning a big massive presence that everybody knows is there and everybody politely avoids mentioning. But it's there. And the third is to quote two of your poets, Sanai and Maulana, who tell the story of an elephant which arrives in the village of the blind. And some blind people touch the ear and conclude that the elephant is a big palm leaf and another touches the leg and says, well, no, it's a big pillar and actually nobody agrees. So what is your vision? Is it a pillar? Is it a palm leaf? <laughs> <laughs> question is yours. Well, I... Uh, when it comes to the U.S. policy, I think... Uh, in the last 50 or half century, the United States has abandoned m many of its allies. For example, Hosni Mubarak in Egypt, the king of Iran, 
uh, and many more in the Middle East. Um, so that's why the United States also abandoned the Republic of Afghanistan, the government, uh, as a matter of policy, if you say, uh, irrespective of Khalilzad. So that was number one. Secondly, uh, it's also uh, how unpredictable uh, President Trump is. I think we predicted all scenarios, but we, no one came with this prediction that Trump will come and cancel the talks because of something. So that also makes it difficult how to have an analysis of U.S. foreign policy. And the third one is the factor of populism that I try to raise, that the whole process is shaped by, and the cancellation is shaped by, if one U.S. soldier is uh, killed, the process is canceled. That shows there is no substantial policy stance. It, it is only kind of moving back and forth because of few uh, electoral decision-making uh, points. So three things are important. Thank you. Mr. Sami, maybe? Maybe I should say just one sentence, that now we know that there is a, an elephant in the room, and it is very unpredictable. With Mr. Trump, uh, that's we, what we understand. We have an elephant in the room and very unpredictable one. Um, um, unfortunately, unfortunately, the peace process is caught up in, the, in between two uh, election processes, one in Afghanistan and another in the United States. So um, the Afghan government and our president and other politicians uh, were talking about the peace process according to their uh, election interests. And the same thing is happening in the United States. So uh, we are waiting just for another tweet. I'm Dale Walker. I teach at the American University. Uh, this is specifically for Professor uh, Molly. Uh, many years ago, you wrote an article that was published in the uh, International uh, Review of the Red Cross and where you laid out brilliantly a historical and geographical analysis of Afghanistan. And I think um, you also quoted in there how Afghanistan had lost its status as the Switzerland of Asia. But you also listed in that the emergence of the Taliban. Today, you said that that was one of the flaws, bringing the Taliban to the, to the, giving them a seat at the peace table. In many of your articles, you evoke international law, you evoke diplomatic law. But under the four Geneva Conventions, who is the Americans supposed to negotiate with when they actually went to war with the Taliban? So I think no one is admitting that America has no choice but to negotiate with who they went to war with, which was the Taliban. Now, who should they exclude is not the point. So I want you to address who should America negotiate with when they actually went to war with the Taliban, and America has her own interest of bringing home her soldiers. Let me respond to that with a comment about the status of the Taliban as an international actor. Uh, when one says that uh, the United States went to war with the Taliban, that can implicitly grant to them uh, a particular kind of status. And so at the outset we should actually ask the question whether uh, the Taliban enjoy the kind of status that would be in place, for example, if you were talking about a war between several states. And the answer probably is that it's a different kind of context that the Taliban, uh, during their period in occupation of Kabul from 1996 to 2001, were only ever recognised diplomatically by three actors, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. They did not succeed at any point in obtaining control of Afghanistan's seat in the General Assembly of the United Nations. And uh, they were not successful in explicitly obtaining control of Afghanistan seats in a range of other international fora as well. So when we're thinking of how one might characterise the Taliban, one can certainly see them as an armed group. But whether one would actually, uh, if from a legal point of view, accurately say that the United States had gone to war with the Taliban is a different kind of question. Uh, if one then goes back to the issue of how the involvement of the United States in Afghanistan from 2001 onwards came to be legitimated, 
Uh, again, it's not in terms of the United States going to war with the Taliban, but in terms of no objection to their presence being raised by the occupants of Afghanistan's seat in the United Nations at the time, uh, in terms of a series of Security Council resolutions which uh, gave approval to the political change which was taking place in Afghanistan following the Bonn uh, Agreement and subsequent engagements between different political actors, and then the consent of an Afghan government with broad international recognition and control of Afghanistan seats in international organisations to the presence of the United States as a force. So, and this may seem arcane, but I think it's, it's uh, central to the issue, the involvement of the United States here uh, is probably best characterised as resisting threats to the position of a legitimately recognised government under international law. And the Taliban, in that sense, can claim no greater status than any bandit killer or murderer that is uh, attacking civilians as part of a tactic or strategy to try to deal itself into the game. The question then becomes a raw question of whether talking to this group is actually likely to deliver anything of value at all. Uh, and that brings us back to the broader thrust of this panel, uh, which is concerned with really the character of the negotiation process that was undertaken and, uh, and, uh, and has now collapsed. And my view for a very long period of time is, has been that uh, one needs to uh, uh, engage with groups such as the Taliban only with the greatest of caution, with a great deal of scepticism about whether anything positive is likely to accrue. I didn't go into this in my earlier remarks, but I actually see not a shred of credible evidence that the Taliban, if they got near state power, would be any different from what they were like in the 1990s. And that's a consideration with which uh, one also needs to live when one's looking at what a negotiation process might deliver. So it's a bit of a convoluted answer. But <coughs> Thank you for your nice presentations. and. I'm Mahmoud Usman Tariq from European Institute of Peace, embedded and working with the State Ministry for Peace. Um, I have uh, no uh, really a question, but rather than um, a point to raise here, uh, from my experience, um, having a peace process top somewhere is not quite of the peace process. It can continue. We have a proverb in our country that in a stream where water moved before, it can again move. I, I don't believe that this is abandoned at all. The second point that uh, as an Afghan in, I, I may suggest that Afghan government has not to defend itself just with the U.S. and Taliban negotiation. It has to have a plan B and C as well, which we don't have it. If we succeed to have a second and third plan, then if one is abandoned, the other can go ahead. And uh, my, my question will be actually that our panelists raise the exclusion of Iran and India However, I don't know that Iran is excluded. They are part of the uh, support people to the Taliban. But no one talks about Russia, how much it is involved in how it suddenly raised to come to uh, kind of convey, convey some of these discussion meetings between Taliban and Afghan political as well as the Afghan government, uh, HPC, and the Taliban three or four times. And there, is, there, is also, there are also some uh, non-media raised events happening that our politicians are going and coming back and commuting to Moscow. Thank you very much. Uh, broadly speaking, I think almost, or broadly speaking, everybody on the panel did mention uh, either in terms of the past or the present uh, the roles of other countries, uh, but I think uh, the specific question about the role of Iran and India going forward, again, looking ahead in the peace process ahead, 
Uh, does anyone want to speak? Uh, to, does anyone here on the panel want to volunteer to speak on Iran and India? I, I, want, I just had a comment about Russia. Okay. Uh, well, Russia then. Uh, it, I'm glad you brought Iran. up Russia, uh, Eric. Uh, I think one of the difficulties in assessing Russia at the moment is that yeah. Russia in its international engagements has proved capable of being both strategic and mischievous. And it's quite difficult to know when looking at things like its hosting um, delegations in Moscow whether it is actually trying to pursue a strategic objective uh, or whether it's just stirring the pot a little bit uh, in order to um, add a certain amount of salt and pepper to its relations with other powers in the world with Afghanistan simply op providing the opportunity to do something like that. And I think it's certainly one that we need to watch, but how it plays out I is not so clear. Could I also endorse the point you make about having plan Bs and plan Cs? It's sort of elementary diplomatic planning that if you go into a negotiation process, you do a kind of of split chain discussion where you think, well, if, if X, what then? If Y, what then? And one of the things that astounds me is that anyone was surprised that, uh, that it, things finally unraveled with a, a tweet from, from President Trump. I've been saying for months and months that, that Halazad was not the final decision maker, it was Trump the most unpredictable president in American history. Uh, and, in, and ironically, some of the people who've expressed the greatest shock and horror at Trump's uh, tweet have been people who, in their writing about Trump's domestic politics, have been scathingly critical of how erratic he's been, and that there's a conundrum there. Professor, <coughs> Professor Omar Sadr, uh, maybe a few words about Iran and India? Uh, one of the students of Professor Milley, uh, Nishank, has written about typology of uh, spoilers uh, and peace process. So usually when we are talking about the rule of regional countries, uh, they are characterized as a spoilers, but we need to know how, what are the uh, specific types of these. Uh, Russians, sometimes uh, it's manageable a spoiler because their interest could be addressed and you can, in exchange of something, you can manage their uh, uh, spoiler behavior. But in case of Pakistanis, it's quite hard to convince them um, to convert their behavior. So it's that I, I, I was somehow um, uh, amazed by the way that uh, Ambassador Khalilzad said that Pakistanis do not have any, any institutional linkage with the Taliban. Uh, and we have miscalculated all this, uh, this issue. So, uh, so that's why um, the way that uh, we analyze the regional context, it matters. Uh, and to convert, to believe that Pakistanis has changed their behavior, it's not that easy. Uh, that's Thank you very much. Uh, we have a question in the back there. In the next to last row, please. You can take the microphone all the way to the back. So we discussed a lot about regional consensus. But I think we need to talk about the importance of a common narrative inside Afghanistan too. Um, but we, see, we saw that Taliban talks from a stronger position because they have a clear sense. But we, our government says one thing, our political parties say another thing, the new generation says another thing. So I think we are not, we are not um, talking from a stronger position um, in Taliban art. The question is how we can um, create a common narrative um, so we, to, to help us um, when we are on the negotiation tables with Taliban to start from a strong position. Um, first. Second, from Dr. Omar, I am really interested to hear more about um, the current popular um, global trend and how that can, understanding that, how, how can help us um, to better negotiate um, in the future once the intra Afghan Okay, maybe I will ask uh, okay, Mr. Sami Mehdi to answer. The oh. first one I can okay, the then in fact, uh, <laughs> Minister Shababi will answer the first question. The second yes, the first one year, because uh, I was in Doha and as well in the first regional meeting in Moscow. So it was a question came uh, for, from one of the youth representative in Herat as well. Uh, the Taliban, they have the common view, the common uh, standing, and so it is, uh, it is common because Taliban following a kind of dictatorship uh, uh, regime. 
So when the, uh, the Amir is dictating something, all of them, they are following the same uh, ideology. Even the text that they are written, it's something that they cannot change only a word of that text. I was chairing the, uh, the draft committee of the declaration, and so they brought a declaration, a drafting declaration by the, in Pashto language. When we wanted to uh, uh, translate it in Dari, they were surprised at how they can change. Is it fit with that, uh, the uh, Pashto one? Because that a text came from, the, uh, from their leadership. Of course, they cannot change anything. It's uh, like, a, they are like, a, we, ha we call it Aspegodi. Uh, they are the, the horse of the, uh, what we call it, Godi? Pardon? Yes, this is just going like that. So the democracy required that everyone should have different idea, different uh, thought. Of course, uh, it is not something that we cannot manage. We can manage later, but uh, in Doha, the problem was that even uh, we, we uh, the, uh, saw each other on the plane, even before we couldn't, uh, had, uh, we couldn't have a, a meeting that at least we could or, uh, organize ourselves. This it is the problem. It needs a lot. It needs a lot of work, but there is a, uh, some positive uh, uh, issue. I, uh, I have seen a lot of com uh, common view between the civil society, youth, women, and the government. The, so, there were so many, so, so many commonality between the government and the civil society, youth group, and women's group. This is, this is very positive. Of course, the political party, they have their own agenda, especially before the election, because they wanted to run their own agenda. That's why you could see some difference, but it can, it can be, uh, it is manageable. First on the question of strength, I think we should not translate or understand strength as a heavy-handedness. Diversity is itself strength, and in democracy, it's okay. But as uh, Professor Mele was referring, it's about mechanism, how we manage this diversity. Uh, but in Afghanistan, government even interprets uh, strength as a heavy-handedness, which has had a negative implication on the process. On the global trends, um, in IR literature, I think um, that unipolarity is mainly unstable. Unipolarity also has led to the rise of global jihadism. Um, the new liberal uh, system of economics has also led to some kind of dissatisfaction and jihadism. And finally, um, that how much the, the concept of right and left has become irrelevant. Um, and this, that, do, that we do not completely comprehend this understanding of the concept of the political um, and the antagonism which has been established by this somehow mislead it as. Um, so that's why uh, I think uh, if you look at the global structure of the distribution of power and the unipolarity which is led by the U.S., it's in transition, but somehow the system is un uh, unstable. And this instability is also reflected the rise of global jihadism, which Taliban is part of that one. Professor Mali, you wanted to say, add something? Yes, I'm very glad you put your finger on the issue of values, because that uh, highlights something about uh, negotiation which is often overlooked. How you frame a negotiation is very significant in determining what you then uh, consider as central issues that need to be addressed or resolved. And I've been worried for a couple of years now at how the problem in Afghanistan has been framed by some of the people who are looking at it. And specifically, there was an article in the American press by uh, uh, the, the American former official Laurel Miller, which defined the problem in Afghanistan, the problem of conflict, as vested interests on all sides. Those were her specific words. Now, the moment you frame a conflict purely as a conflict of interest, you uh, imply that there is a distributive uh, solution to the problem, that you can either bring in new resources or trade resources and you get a solution. That will not necessarily apply if there is a significant divergence of values between the different parties which are in conflict with each other. And to me, there's been far too much of a disposition to wish away the gulf in values between the Taliban and other forces in Afghan society, as if that is something that is just going to be magically resolved by uh, an ill-defined intra-Afghan dialogue. When you have fundamental divergences over 
values. Putting people in the same room is not necessarily a pathway to any kind of solution. It can actually just uh, play the role of remitting a conflict back to a battlefield or something like that. And so there needs, I think, to be a, a, a very uh, stark realisation that we're not just looking at conflicts of interest here, we're looking at more complex conflicts than, than an interest-based conflict alone would present to us. I'm going to come back over here in a second, but I know we have a few students here, and uh, there's been a lot of talk uh, over the, about the interest of youth and generational divides. So uh, do any of the students who are here wish to, wish to raise a question or make a comment? Uh, my name is Mehdi. Uh, I'm a student at the American University of Afghanistan. And my question is, we have three main groups who want to go for a peace talk. The Afghan government, uh, the U.S., and the Taliban. So here my question is, why, uh, despite the international ap peace efforts, why is still Taliban wants to have this negotiation only with the U.S.? And while excluding the Afghan government, what is that main thing that the Taliban is looking for, that the U.S. should provide them with? Thank you very much. So uh, who would like to take on the question of why did the Taliban uh, say they can only negotiate with the U.S.? Okay. Uh, but Minister first and then, and then Bill, okay. When I talked with them, they said that uh, we had a government, we had a system. So it was the EU that destroyed all our system. That, uh, that's why we want first talk with the U.S. and then with the government of Afghanistan. This is the reason that they, they are talk, talking about that. Uh, there's a very specific strategy which is at play here, which is delegitimation of the government of Afghanistan. Governments in international affairs have a particular status which arises from their being the accredited representatives of states in a whole range of areas and the repositories of authority in respect of a whole range of policy areas. So if you want to advance your own position and you have limited claims to authority of your own, one way of going about it is try to undermine the legitimacy of those whom you are challenging. And classically, the way in which you would do that in a democratic election is by offering yourself as a candidate and accepting the outcome if the election is free and fair and you're a loser. Uh, but whenever I see a group which shies away from that as a matter of principle, to me it's a warning sign that they know in their heart of hearts that they might like to exercise power, but a lot of people around them would not like to see, to see them exercise any power at all. Well, as uh, Professor Melly said, I think they are not negotiating with the government because it will further delegitimize the government if they do not talk to the government. Second, I don't believe, I don't think that uh, the Taliban were going to finally talk to the Afghan government after if they had their, uh, uh, the peace uh, signed by President Trump. Because... Uh, they never said they will talk to the Afghan government directly, even after their uh, peace uh, settlement with the American side. Uh, they always said they will talk to the Afghan government and other stakeholders in the society, and Afghan government will be just one of them. It means that they were not ready to give the status of government to the Afghan government, and the reason behind that is um, um, they do not want to give the legitimacy to the government. And I think after the withdrawal of uh, the American forces, the Afghan government will lose its only, the, the, I mean, the most important leverage for the peace process, which is the presence of international troops in Afghanistan. I think one of the complex pros, uh, issues uh, and challenges with the peace process was that the government of Afghanistan was... Uh, position was reduced to just a player or one party among so many others in the in the intro afghan the so-called intra afghan uh, peace discussion and, and i was it was very interesting to see that all the panelists when we were talking about the future we were again referring to the role of the government as that we should include the afghan government in the peace process uh, uh, now uh, if we have I'm assuming that we're going to have a an acceptable election, and we're going to have a new government formed. Do you think we should still um, promote the narrative that we should include the government, or we should 
really think about the government, the new government taking the lead all of the peace process on the on behalf of Afghanistan with the Taliban. Okay, thank you very much for that question. Um, uh, uh, Professor Barry has also uh, noted that uh, the topic of Iran has not been addressed. Uh, what I'm going to ask uh, the panelists, uh, uh, we started with Bill, so this time we'll end with Bill. So we'll, uh, I'll ask each of you to make a couple of closing remarks, address the question that was raised about whether in the next round, whether the Afghan government should just be part of an inter-Afghan dialogue or whether it should be the lead. Uh, if you have uh, some thoughts on Iran and the final closing thoughts. And so a couple of minutes from each of the panelists as we go across here. Starting with you, Mr. Sani Modi. Well, I think um, to address your question, I think it pretty much depends on the legitimacy of the elections we are going to have uh, on Saturday. If uh, we are going to have a similar election like the one we had in 2014, I don't think uh, the uh, upcoming government will be in a position to lead the peace process. Uh, but you never know if you are going to have a fair and uh, sound elections on Saturday. That will produce a different kind of government and uh, more legitimacy to stand its ground against the Taliban and lead the peace uh, process. About Iran, I think uh, as much as the uh, relationship between Iran and the United States uh, uh, getting worse day by day, that will have a direct effect on Afghanistan peace process and the stability of Afghanistan. We know that Iran, Pakistan, all of our neighboring countries have uh, stake in this country and uh, uh, they are pursuing their own uh, state interests. And uh, uh, therefore, I think uh, what's happening now uh, in the Middle East, especially between Iran and Saudi Arabia, that will have a direct effect on Afghanistan. We know the Fatimuns. We are, some of them are coming back to Afghanistan. We know that some of uh, Daesh from Afghanistan and uh, from the Central Asian countries are coming back to Afghanistan to maybe cross to Central Asia or stay here. So the, uh, the um, war between Saudi Arabia and Iran is already going on in Afghanistan. So uh, I'm afraid that will have even more bad effects on Afghanistan. Um, I agree that uh, the outcome of election will determine the status of government and the process. If we have a very strong government as outcome, which is less likely, of course, the government will be much, much legitimate to lead. But at the end, because of a fragmented society that you have, you need to include in everyone, even if, the, if, if we have a clear-cut winner also, the winner should be much more inclusive to accommodate others and the process. Uh, in the region, I think there's a kind of divergence of perspectives and strategies. The, most of the regional countries, including Iran, uh, their priorities in the mega projects, mega economic uh, geopolitical projects like Chabahar, North-South Corridor, connect connectivity, same as with Iran, uh, with Indians. And they see the long-term presence of the U.S. in region against this mega projects in region. So somehow that's number one. Second, um, the concern of Iran, is, as it was mentioned, it's because of the uh, growing presence of Daesh in Afghanistan. So that's why they justify their new linkages with the Taliban based on the same concern. But um, ultimately what they want is a stake in the process, to not be excluded by the US-led uh, um, uh, peace process. Uh, not only Iran, but the relation between Iran and, and, and Saudi Arabia, when uh, Sami Mahdi also mentioned, it's uh, directly affecting the, uh, um, the peace process in Afghanistan. India and Pakistan relation is also something that is directly affecting the uh, peace process in Afghanistan, not, not only this country, but chi China, because they have a uh, relation with Pakistan and how they can get benefit from that relation or, or, uh, or 
or lose some, something, it's also... So Afghanistan is somewhere that all the regional country can... Uh, of course, we have been talked about Russia and so or, uh, other country. All of them, they will have the, their uh, um, uh, effective to the uh, peace process in uh, Afghanistan. About this, uh, um, uh, the next plan, or the government can start, uh, why not? Uh, so if we will have, and I, I do have, I hope that we will have, uh, a, a, as a result of the, or outcome of the election, uh, we will have a strong government. If we have a strong government, uh, the government can, uh, can take this uh, lead, the lead in, in starting, as uh, uh, you said, that uh, the plan B will be, uh, we, we cannot wait only for the United States to, uh, uh, to uh, start it or to uh, start negotiation with them. We, uh, we are thankful from the support of the United States, but the government of Afghanistan also uh, can take some uh, decision or make some, take some step for negotiation. Hope that uh, the outcome of election will have a strong government that we can start ourselves. Thank you. I, I think it's actually the government that needs to be in the driving seat in processes of this sort. Um, the one situation in which you might not give that status to a government is if you are talking about a puppet government which has virtually no uh, uh, empirical sovereignty and no autonomy, perhaps Barbara Kamal, 1980-81. Uh, but the history of attempting to conduct negotiations in the absence of a government that is not a puppet government is an extremely unhappy one. Uh, there are three main historical examples. The Munich Conference of September 1938 in which the British, the French, the Germans and the Italians negotiated the fate of the Sudetenland in Czechoslovakia in the absence of Czechoslovak representation. The uh, uh, Czechoslovakia was overrun by March 1939 by German forces. Uh, the uh, Paris Accords on Vietnam uh, directly between the United States and, and the uh, insurgent forces. Um, uh, within uh, less than three years, uh, Saigon had fallen. Uh, and then, perhaps less noted, the case of the way in which the United Nations as well as states treated the Bosnian government after Bosnia was admitted to UN independence as if it were just another faction uh, in a conflict on the ground rather than an actor with a distinctive status by virtue of what it had achieved internationally. And again, that was a disaster that led to uh, gross ethnic cleansing, uh, severe social problems in Bosnia which persist to this day and in no sense a model to follow. And uh, uh, I can't think of a single historical example where exclusion of uh, a non-puppet government from uh, a predominant role in a peace process has led to anything but catastrophe. Well, thank you, Professor Malley. I uh, thank all of you. I'd like to uh, close with uh, uh, four quick points. First, I'd like to thank all of our panelists and I'd like to ask the audience to join me in giving a round of applause to them. <laughs> Secondly, I'd like to thank our uh, co-sponsors, uh, the uh, Ministry of Peace and the Afghan Institute for uh, the American Institute of Afghan Studies uh, for, uh, for working together to, to have this event, which I think has been r really productive and, and highly intellectual, stimulate, uh, stimulating intellectually. Third, I'd like to thank all of the audience, uh, the, the, uh, the visitors from outside who came, uh, the American University of Afghanistan faculty. Uh, thank you very much for your time uh, and for your patience. Uh, for the students who came, I want to thank you especially uh, for coming out on, the, on a national holiday, which we uh, l learned, I guess, this morning is a national holiday. So I want to thank the audience. My fourth point, however, is the deep, deep desire of everyone here for peace. This university, our faculty, our students, our staff have suffered. We have lost friends, people who we know and value have, have lost their lives in this conflict over the, in recent years. Hundreds, uh, over a hundred of our students, faculty, and staff were injured in an attack. And I would ask everyone to remember in their thoughts and their prayers our two professors, uh, Kevin King and Timothy Weeks, who over three years ago were kidnapped, remain held prisoner, and who have no reason to be held prisoner. They are professors. Three years of students have lost the opportunity to be taught by them. They were not fighters, they weren't attacking anyone. We at the university have no power. We can't do anything to uh, address the issues that the people who took them have. 
So I will end this by calling once again for the release of our two prisoners. For anyone who listens to this, who has anything to do with this, please, please release Kevin King and Timothy Weeks. With that, I want to thank all of you for your, for your, atten for your attention and um, look forward to more events of this as I hope we see continued movement to peace. Thank you all.